Thank you, Tom. Hi, everybody. We appreciate this opportunity to be here with you tonight and share our ideas and speak with you about PR and how to raise awareness and make your product famous. I'm Kara Sloman. I'm the EVP at Nadel Phelan. And as Tom said, we've had the great pleasure and op opportunity of working together in the past for many years. And with me is our Director of Account Services, Peggy Galvin. And yeah, we're excited to give you an overview of the evolving media landscape and best practices for securing media coverage that drives visibility and results. So as Tom said, please feel free to share your questions in the chat along the way, and we will address them at the end. So first, a little bit more about us. Our company, Nadel Phelan, specializes in B2B tech, PR, and marketing for a roster of clients ranging from industry giants, like Cisco, as Tom mentioned, to mid-sized businesses, publicly traded companies, and innovative startups. We've been doing business for over 25 years, combining our experience and expertise to help clients all over the world establish and maintain awareness in the global marketplace. So today we will discuss how to make an impact in today's media landscape, which is evolving rapidly and discuss some key strategies to implement and why they would be effective. And this includes preparing you for a range of situations or interactions that you might encounter with the press, how to turn your messages into news hooks and improve your quotability, understand the world of the journalist because understanding how to give the media what they want will ultimately result in more positive media coverage for you and your product at the end of the day and your role in the interview and how to deal with some of those difficult situations that Tom alluded to earlier. So why PR? So let's step back for a moment and imagine you've established category leadership, you've broken into tier one media and you are seen as the expert commentator in the space. There's a strong cadence of thought leadership shaping the conversation in the industry and your company is leveraging a ton of great PR through social media to help influence the influencers. Well, if that's where you wanna be, the right PR strategy can help get you there. At the top of the funnel, a consistent PR program will help generate a great deal of awareness and demand. As your product gains media coverage, organic search display articles with media will help increase that third party credibility. PR is also effective in building high value backlinks from other media websites that will help boost your referral and organic traffic and drive traffic to the site over time as well. PR also creates content marketing services that highlight the key benefits of your product and help shine a light on customer successes. You know, anyone can buy an ad and while ads and advertorials have their merits, earned media coverage provides the kind of third-party validation that customers want to see and that trust. By improving your awareness, credibility, and valid, val validity, organizations will increase awareness in the market and set you up for successful exit, which could include an acquisition or an IPO. All that said, one of the main reasons why PR is so powerful is that you're essentially trying to control the uncontrollable. And these are market forces, influencers, timing, relationships, all of these things factor into a successful product launch that can garner attention, great positive momentum for your company or your product. However, let's not forget that old Murphy's Law that what can go wrong sometimes will go wrong. So let's take a quick look at some of these tricky situations that I think we'd all like to avoid that will give us some further context into what we're gonna to cover today. And there are always unpredictable, so 
have no idea what we're gonna find. They are slow today. You know, you can help me out if you're on Wi-Fi, if you could just get off. I appreciate it. Franz, could you try to break this glass, please? Too hard. <laughs> What's more like in my space right now? People thinking there's some good stuff happening. No? Yes. What's it like having two co presidents? Is that working? Anything? <laughs> really? Like, that's the whole interview is just you nervously smiling at the camera. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. So hopefully that will never happen to you. But through our discussion today, you'll gain an understanding of how to best prepare for interviews in difficult situations where that might arise and uh, gain an understanding of the current media landscape, as I mentioned, how to handle interviews. And some of you will get to practice. Now I'll turn it over to Peggy for a look at what's going on in the media landscape today. Absolutely, hello everyone. So to start off, let's take a look at where PR lives within your larger marketing mix of owned media, paid media, and earned media. They all work together. Ideally, they all have very, very similar messaging and components but let's break it down into which uh, category is what. Owned media are those messages and those assets that you own and control completely. You own the platform, you own the content, you own the message. This can be something like your corporate blog, your social media sites and accounts. You own it, you put it out, you control the cadence, you control the content. That's your own media. Paid media are things like a microsite or paid articles on something like a tech target. It's something like your Google ad spend for advertisements. And it er can also be things like paid webinars or white papers that you retain the services of an industry technology analyst where you have paid for the asset and you're leveraging it as, as an asset that you've paid for. Earned media is where the concept traditionally understood as PR lives. So that is media that you've earned. That's coverage that you've earned through a press release, through an announcement, through an interview. And they all work together as part of a healthy and holistic marketing mix that you can leverage to create awareness and buy-in and validation about your solution. So when you think about your current marketing mix and the challenges that you as an individual within your organization and you as an, individ as an organization are facing, uh, let's do a little poll. If you have your chat at the the ready, if you can put into your chat whether your thought, your biggest pain points in PR and marketing are around awareness of your products or services, whether you'd like to see more engagement from prospective customers, if you really would like to have more assets at the ready to describe the value of your product, or more third-party industry validation. Drop that into the poll if you would. I think I have to do it too. So I'm going to press something. <laughs> there you go. We usually leave this up for uh, a minute, but I spare everyone uh, humming the Jeopardy theme song as their, <laughs> their answers. That would be a good one. All right. So no, it would be. <laughs> <laughs> I know. RIP, Alex. All right. So the media landscape in 2021. Obviously, there are uh, very specific trends that we're still uh, 
experiencing a, a hangover of sorts from hashtag 2020. But by and large, there are a number of macro trends that have come to a head in 2021 that have been building up for the past decade. And that is encapsulated in the consolidation of advertising budgets in major platforms like Facebook and Google ads, where traditional publications online are competing for fewer and fewer ad dollars. And what that means is those publications have fewer reporters, they have fewer resources, they're competing amongst each other for fewer eyeballs. So that means they need more content, they need more help, and they have a greater reliance on freelance writers as opposed to a very broad and deep bench of, of journalists. It also means that those folks who are spinning all those plates left at the, at the publications themselves um, very much appreciate news that is delivered in a very easily digestible form. They do not have the time to sift through pages and pages of content about your solution or your product or your company. They would prefer it if it were delivered in as close to the finished format as possible. So this is where your PR training and PR team can help you in putting it into that narrative and the care abouts for that particular audience. And as we see from the major tech companies in the field that are doing fewer and fewer press releases, uh, press releases on their own are not enough to get you the type of coverage and awareness that you're looking for. You know, I, when you said earlier, Tom, about uh, you referred to Steve Jobs and Apple, it's kind of a, a joke that we have internally that the easiest job in the world would be Apple PR because they barely need to do anything. You know, their entire, you know, cottage industries built up around reading Apple tea leaves and what they might be doing and what they might be putting out. But for the rest of us in industry and infrastructure technology, you really need to work for it. And so your PR strategy needs to include uh, digital marketing and a number of other marketing tactics to get you the type of coverage that you're looking for. So here's an overview of some of the common media types that you might encounter as you begin to be more of a spokesperson for your company. The two main buckets are print and digital outlets and broadcast media. Print and digital, the blogs that we know and love, the digital equivalents of print publications that we're all familiar with. As mentioned earlier, their staffs are getting thinner their employees are getting lower. And as a result, their longtime staffers that maybe cost more are being let go, becoming freelancers. And those that remain are a lot more junior, which means that they might not know as much about technology. This will factor into how we approach these folks and how we position uh, our news for them in a way that they can digest and understand. Certainly, if your company is paying an outlet for ads and advertising, that helps. You know, certainly it uh, doesn't hurt. But where you can also provide um, good differentiation to get you in the door and get coverage is to be able to provide helpful context about breaking news as it's happening. Uh, editors want to know how your news fits into the larger trends of the day. So anytime there is statistics or analyses or trends or facts or figures, they love it. It's great to include that. It's something that they look for is that added context and detail. And the readers, the folks at home, want to know how your solution will help solve a major problem. And they're looking for best practices that they can put into use in their own organizations. Now flip it over to broadcast media. You know, back in the before times when we were actually in things like airport terminals and watching CNN in line waiting to, to board, we know that these folks are 
brought on to speak for maybe 30 seconds or less, maybe even 15 seconds. So your goal, if you are actually on broadcast or as Tom referenced earlier, even on radio, you need to distill your message into very quick and easily digestible sound bites. Very quick, very short, and uh, as lively as possible in your delivery and also in the imagery that you use. And when you're on broadcast, whether it's fair or not, the viewer is retaining about 80% of their impression from your visual appearance. So you need to project authority, you need to project confidence, and that's what the viewer will come away with their impression is your company and what you're selling. Motivation. So understanding what the journalist wants is the first way to make sure that you are delivering what you're saying in a way that gets to what their incentive is in a way that they will be happy to take your story and run with it. So there are three main buckets, the story, the gory, and the glory. The story is the, the narrative of the day. You know, the, the Twitter motto is what's happening? So this is what's happening. What is the, the big talker for the day? What are folks chatting about? What new technology is out and about? Um, being able to write about the first big draft of history. Um, think about when the iPhone came out for the first time um, or the, the, new, the, the microprocessor. You know, what the opportunity to write about the first draft of history, especially in technology, is, is big and folks might not know that it's happening at the time. Uh, being able to provide context to a story that their competitors are writing about and being able to uh, keep up with the news in an era where it seems like news is never ending from a fire hose. And then providing context for readers about the so what how all of this relates to them, why they should care, how it impacts them and their business. Every single publication has a different uh, niche audience that they're going after and being able to identify how to communicate your solution and your expertise in a way that is relevant for their audience is fundamental. The gory. This is uh, the if it bleeds, it leads or uh, if any of you all remember the 80s, Don Henley's Dirty Laundry. This is uh, the tabloid sensationalism. And this is even more important now than ever when we're talking about ad dollars and we're talking about clicks. Headlines that are sensational get clicks, they get eyeballs, and that's where the advertising dollars pay off. So it's a challenge for uh, companies that sell infrastructure technology, for example, um, but there is a way to get into these conversations if you do, it's smart. And again, understand what drives the journalist. So breaches of the day. If you have a cybersecurity solution, making sure to contribute to the conversation in a way that is helpful and constructive and talks about best practices in solving it, as opposed to what we call ambulance chasing. Uh, feuds, controversy, and drama. Think, um, you know, Larry Ellison and everyone that he went punching around at at SAP over the years, uh, personal misfortunes, um, all the GameStop stuff that you know everyone's been reading about for the past week or so, the people who have uh, gone from riches to rags and all the, the hedge funds there. Disasters, 2020 was full of them. How do you contribute to the conversation in a way that gets your company uh, coverage but is in a respectful and again, helpful and contextual way. And the humiliation of powerful people. Nobody likes it, but we like to read about it if it's happening to other people. And then the glory. These are things that young journalists or even middle-aged journalists dream of when they go to journalism school. They want to have uh, the Pulitzer Prize level story that puts them in the upper echelons of, of their peers' estimation. 
These are things like uncovering major scandals at the highest levels of government or business, maybe a backdoor router or a backdoor in a router that the NSA was using, for example. Um, finding hidden truths, um, getting a scoop that none of your colleagues have gotten. Um, being the first to a source in a breaking news situation that uh, you know that your competition has access to as well. Um, if your company has a high profile or high powered individual, maybe a hacker or a creator of a particular type of technology, or um, someone who is very close to a zero day as it unfolded, like one of Wired um, and their TikTok kind of pieces. These are all things that motivate uh, journalists to write as well. And when we talk about journalists, what kind of journalists are we talking about? Now, over the years that we have been doing this, these are very general buckets, but by and large, folks tend to fall into one of these buckets when we look at the, the journalists that we talk to. Um, the news hound has a story in mind. They have a nose for the news. They know that there is a juicy scoop in the offing. And in the before times, when we actually had offices and went into them, uh, they would not call your office phone. They would not reach out to your uh, office email because they knew that people like Kara and I are there to flag those and to triage them and say, do not talk to our spokespersons, talk to us. They would call your personal cell phone. They would text you directly. They would email you directly. They would try to catch you unawares. These are the people who get you in trouble. Don't talk to them directly. We'll talk about that later. The cub. These are bright-eyed and bushy-tailed folks directly out of college. They are still nice and optimistic. We love them. They are fantastic. Uh, we find them often and more often these days, as we mentioned, with newsrooms being decimated by various cutbacks. The challenge with folks such as yourselves who are very experienced and technical is that they might ask questions that you see as very naive or green or betraying a fundamental ignorance of the technology that you think is very important for them to be aware of. But resist any urge to be condescending or, or reply in a curt way because if you treat them with kindness and with um, magnanimity, then you can foster a really great relationship with these folks. And again, because the turnover rate is so high, they will be ascending to the higher echelons of their newsroom in short order, and they will remember how you treated them. Now, on the flip side of things, the long timers remember uh, how things were 30 years ago. They remember where your boss was five companies ago and all the scandals from that company and have a ton of very, very excellent contextual information about the industry. Um, that also means they may have some prejudices from back in the day, just like very ancient feuds that uh, are very meaningful to them. They uh, but they also know what a great story is and can write it straight away. And they are great people to, to be able to be respectful of. Specialists. These are folks like Brian Krebs, Krebs on Security, or Chris Meller of Blocks and Files. These are people who perhaps were analysts at one point, perhaps worked in industry at one point. They are extremely technical and extremely specific and oftentimes industries unto themselves. So be prepared to have your expertise probed in a very specific way that you might not get from any of these other folks. And finally, seasoned professionals. <laughs> these are folks who, works, who work for the likes of the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times. They are not interested in boilerplate answers. They're not interested in rote um, responses. They will go straight for the jugular and you will want to be prepared but play your cards right, and you could get a really good article in the Wall Street Journal. Ultimately, for all these folks, their objective is to educate their audience, entertain their audience, and inform their audience. So our role, what is our role? And 
the royal hour here for uh, for spokespeople. What do the media expect from from us? They want news. They want to educate, entertain, and inform. So they do that through publishing newsworthy things for their audiences. Now, news means something that is different, different from the status quo. And I apologize in advance to all of our wonderful product marketers on, on the line right now. That does not mean a feature enhancement. A feature enhancement is not news, I'm sorry. But if it is first, if it is fastest, if it is biggest, then that is a wow fa factor. If we have any kind of superlative here, that is what makes news. Now I didn't say cheapest here because cheapest is difficult. Usually something being cheap, competing on uh, cost is not really a differentiator. No one is really going to write about a, you know, a seat or a, a license that is a couple bucks cheaper than the other guy. But if you have a technology that you've been able to lower the cost of to the point where it's democratized in such a way like cloud storage where it completely shakes up the market, that's where cost becomes a newsworthy factor. Uh, news is also with research. If you have a study or a survey or backend telemetry data that you're pulling from your platform and you're able to pull some insights from it that are counterintuitive, that is news. Opinion. Maybe you've been burned before with a, an article that you did not like and it terrified you and you don't wanna to talk to the press. And if you do, you only issue very anodyne colorless statements. That's fine. You're just not going to get news that way. The people who do get headlines have opinions and are able to offer their point of view on an issue. It's scary, but you can do it. And we're, people like us are here to help. Controversy and conflict, going against the conventional wisdom, going against the status quo. Elon Musk, great example of this, gets news all the time. Is it the right news? I don't think he cares. His stock is doing great. You can pull it off if you're Elon Musk. If you're the rest of us, you get to work on your key benefit statements. So to wrap it up, news is not just the latest, you know, version 0.3.012 of a solution. It has to be one of these things. Ultimately, the sweet spot is when your agenda and the media's agenda becomes a shared agenda where your goal of getting positive on message coverage, you got all of your speaking points correctly, you got them out in full and complete sentences, your solution is positioned as better than the other guys, the editor on, on his or her part, she got some juicy quotes, a little controversy, maybe you were sassy and she liked it. There was a scoop that no one else, that you didn't give to anybody else. Maybe you made someone exclusively available to them. And uh, you were able to tee up the conversation in a way that it followed a, a classic narrative arc. It's a win-win for everybody. She gets a good story and you get a story that is positive and on message. And so what is that narrative? So before you even think of talking to the press, this is not something you do on the fly. This is a very, very deliberate thing. You establish what the news is and a helpful thought process, practice, exercise is to imagine the headline that you would like to see. In an ideal world, what is the perfect headline that you would like to see after you talk to a member of the press? Start there and build your whole narrative around that. Um, introduce the backdrop. What led this story to happen now? Why now? Why this solution? Why now? Why this trend? Why now? And then why do customers care? You know, if we come out with a headline that 80% of product managers brush their teeth with Crest toothpaste, that's fine. But why do customers care? So being able to attach the significance of these speeds and feeds or market trends to being able to solve an actual customer pain, a business pain that they experience in their job is critical. And deliver your key messages. What are key messages? You have three of them. There are three. There are no more than three. It's important to have three for three reasons. The first reason 
is because it's really easy for you to remember. The second reason is that it's really easy for the writer to remember. And if they can remember it, the number three, it's really easy for the reader to remember. So when they read the article that hopefully has your three messages in it, they will remember you and why your company and product is important for when the salesperson follows up with them and reinforces those three key messages because you have a holistic sales and marketing program going on. So no more than three when you talk to the member of the press, supporting points for each that illustrate why each of those points is important and then repeat them throughout the conversation, keep coming back to them because hopefully they're easy to remember because there are only three. So being able to put them into sound bites is extremely helpful for everybody because that will make them easy to remember. The first is a short overview of the company. All of you did great in the beginning part of this meeting when folks were introducing themselves via chat. A lot of you were using your sound bites. It was great. You did a short overview of your company, what you did, what the company did, what the product does. It was beautiful. I didn't have to, I mean, I can't teach you anything. You guys are already experts. Number two is the business benefit of the, the product and the solution. Again, the features are great. The features are wonderful. But again, how do, why? Why did you create your product? Why did you create your solution? It doesn't exist in a vacuum. What problem was it created to solve? And then again, at the end, the technological differentiators. This in the world of infrastructure technology PR is what amounts to news oftentimes, is why they should take that briefing. How are you different materially from the other guy? And ultimately, being able to come back to these throughout the conversation helps these points lodge in the mind of the reporter and helps them frame up and write your story. And so your elevator pitch. In the before times, when we actually went to conferences, sometimes you would see colleagues. Sometimes you would see friends that you hadn't seen since the last in-person event that you went to the previous year. And you would be in an elevator going to the, the second floor of, of the giant you know, Moscone Center. And they would say, what is it you do again? And your elevator pitch is a little overview of your company. Would anybody like to, uh, to raise their hand and give the elevator pitch of their company if they are feeling up to it? It sure, I'll give. Yeah, I say it doesn't need to be a company if you've got a, a product statement that works too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, your product. You want to talk about some business benefits in uh, ten to thirty seconds? I'll give it a shot. Awesome. Um, and partly because we actually need to work on this as a company, so that's Great. why I'm volunteering. Um, so the company's name is Privacera, and we do compliance for privacy uh, data in um, your cloud data store and analytics. Um, uh oh, now I'm stuck with the word cloud, cloud services, cloud platform. Sorry, I should be better at that. No, sorry, Anna, it, this as is- As far as we got. <laughs> I'm supposed to be writing this. Apparently I didn't write it enough. No, I can tell you, uh, I've done hundreds and hundreds of media training sessions with executives of companies, uh, large and small, and there's been more than one occasion where even the highest echelon of executives is stumped at this question. What do you do? Tell me in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> so it, it doesn't come easy. It, this takes a lot of practice. And as Peggy mentioned earlier, preparation. Yes. I was not prepared, obviously. <laughs> No, but we appreciate you jumping into the fray, Anna. Thanks. Anyone else? What do you do? Who's it for? How's it different? Is that for me or is that for anybody? Anyone, you wanna try it again? <laughs> There's no takers. Okay, we'll go for it. Um, sorry, what was the, how is it? Oh, sorry, I missed the four. What do you do? Okay. Who's it for? Who's it how's for? It Ah, I'll see. Okay, so we help protect your uh, personal information for large companies like a company like Equifax. And uh, who is it for? Because that covers who's it for and why is it different? It's different because we do it at scale across multi cloud environments. So you can do it for any system that you have through one single pane of glass. That was excellent. 
There you go. My brain came back. Dramatic improvement from the first go. <laughs> Great job. Thanks for letting me be, uh, let me, letting me experiment. Indeed. We appreciate it. Thanks. Anybody else? I'll give it a try. Go for so it, Jeff. This is for my startup. It's called Grow My AI. It's designed for conversational designers. It's a platform for them to uh, make some side money by selling conversational experiences they've created to other conversational designers. Very interesting. Succinct, definitely under 30 seconds. Say so you've got it down. You've been giving that pitch quite a bit. I've been working on it. Does it give you enough detail? Do you understand what it does or does it leave you with questions? Yes, and essentially with an elevator pitch, the first floor, you want someone to say, interesting, tell me more. As you go up to that second and third floor to the roof. Yeah. So definitely had me wanting more. Perfect. I'm wondering if that's something like, we teach AI to talk like actual people or something along the lines like that, yeah. where it's people have heard of AI, but they know it's not really there yet. And it sounds like maybe you're taking it a step closer to that. And is that off base or is that close? Yeah, kind of kind of taking the crowdsourced approach to that by letting uh, other conversational designers create their experiences and sell it. And so if you're if you're building uh, an experience, you could purchase a template that I've created and it can speed you up. And I've already created this beautiful experience. You've interacted with it. You know, it's a good experience. So you can yeah. kind of take it and use it for your own and run with it. So that's the how. The, the first part was the, the, the what you accomplish and why, you know, or what matters. And then when they say, how do you do that? You, you're all queued up to answer that right. question. That's right. Sounds good. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. And that's a great point you made, especially in the realm of technology and certainly with B2B. Um, it can get very complex. And to be able to distill that down into a way that people can understand um, succinctly is a real art and a science. Anybody else? Any other brave souls want to step up to the plate? Give the elevator pitch a go. All right. Well, we are happy to hang out after the session and certainly chat about elevator pitches with anyone who wants to do that as a follow on. But in the meantime, let's move on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some tactics for interviews. First off, when you should not do an interview. <laughs> and Tom, you set this up nicely with your preamble about the radio interview in five minutes. Um, this it, that wasn't quite the ambush that we're going to illustrate here, but that was definitely a, an exciting moment, I'm sure. Uh, you might encounter a situation where a reporter drops in on you when you're least expecting it. This could be on the phone, it could be in person at an event when we get back to those good old days. Um, the key here is that you want to get your ducks in a row and prepare for the conversation before you just launch into a briefing because that could end up quite badly. Um, essentially, we wanna understand what the journalist wants to talk about, how much time they need, who they are, what publication they're with, and how to get in touch with them. So if this happens to you, let them know you're happy to help and you're in the middle of something and let them know you'll call them back. That'll give you a chance to collect all of those important points and hopefully loop in your PR person so they can help vet the opportunity, determine it's one that you want to participate in and that you're the right person to do so. Also, um, and we'll talk about this in a minute, uh, sometimes the topic ends up being something completely different than what you're prepared to address, which we call a hijacked interview that can uh, oftentimes be uh, very exciting and in badly. Next up, <laughs> when should you do an interview? Well, 
The answer is when you're fully prepared, of course. So if you're working with a PR team, they will likely provide you with a background briefing document before any engagement with a journalist. This will typically include who they are, what pub they write for, what they're interested in writing about and speaking to you about, and hopefully some of their recent articles so you can get a feel for their tone and the types of stories that they write. I highly encourage you to read these briefing documents. I know everybody gets busy, but you will be so much better off with a little preparation ahead of the game than just jumping into the fray with the journalist. You will understand what the topic is and hopefully be able to arm yourself with your key messages and a couple of industry statistics and anecdotes that will help you illustrate those key messages Peggy talked about. Prepare three and only three, otherwise you end up overfilling the glass, so to speak, and you will likely leave the journalist's head spinning and wondering what it was that you said at the end of the day. We strongly encourage that you always have a member of the PR team with you when speaking with a journalist. There are a number of reasons for this, but most importantly, it's protection for yourself to make sure that the conversation stays on track and also to take any action items resulting through the conversation to help drive that to a successful piece of coverage for you and your product at the end of the day. Just remember you are representing your company brand and your behavior reflects your brand values. A couple words on setting ground rules. So you are always on the record. This means that anything you say can show up in an article with your name or your company's name on it. So I always like to say, unless you wanna see something in a headline with your name, don't say it. <laughs> you may not even know the usage or how the material is going to be used until it hits the press. Um, on the record is the default setting of every journalist. So if you operate under that assumption, you will be in good standing. I had an executive one time uh, <laughs> interview had concluded, the notebooks were closed. It was the chit chat on the way to the door and the journalist said, oh, by the way, did you hear about such and such? And the executive took the bait, gave them a real zinger, and lo and behold, did that not show up in an article that very day. <laughs> there was not an article on the topic that we briefed them on, but uh, that little dramatic uh, controversial quote that he gave them certainly created a lot of buzz. The type of buzz nobody wants to see at the end of the day. So I can't... It, it press upon this enough. You're always on the record, stay on message. They might be nice people, but they are not your friends. <laughs> this is true. Um, no comment in and of itself is a comment. It implies guilt. It's one of those things. If you don't know the answer to a question or you're not sure if you should answer it, it is a-okay to let them know why you can't answer it and bridge to something that you want to talk about. So here's one example of that, where you could, you know, uh, be asked a question and respond with, uh, I'm not here to talk about that, but what I can tell you is, so on. At the end of the day, stay calm, stand your ground, and avoid confrontation. You don't want to get into an argument with a journalist. <laughs> All right, a couple points on the practical in preparing for press interviews. Always good to know how much time they have because you wanna make sure that you have enough time to get your key messages across. Not every briefing is 30 minutes or an hour, especially with those tier one season reporters that Peggy was mentioning earlier, they might give you 10 minutes. So if you know that going into the conversation, you can structure your communication accordingly, starting with that most important point first, obviously. Clarify what it is they're writing about. What is the focus? So that you're sure that you can deliver something that's of value to them. 
as we were talking about earlier with that shared nexus. Listen very carefully to their questions because sometimes journalists have a habit of stating hypothetical questions as a fact. And if yeah. you do not agree with it, you need to be explicit about that and correct them. Otherwise you might see your name quoted next to something that you don't agree with. Always show respect and friendliness. These are long-term relationships that could serve you more than just a one pop shot at a piece of coverage on your latest product launch. Developing those long lasting relations over time are really key. Uh, again, avoid saying anything you don't wanna see in print. <laughs> Stick to the facts and don't guess. If again, you don't know or you're not sure, that is fine. Let them know, you'll take that as an action item and get back to them, it's okay. And be passionate. At the end of the day, you are selling. You are selling stories, you are selling ideas that energy and enthusiasm comes through. You can leave that conversation on a high with them thinking, gosh, that was such a great interview. What a knowledgeable, passionate expert. I wanna have that person in my, my roster to comment on future stories. All right, so earlier in the conversation, we showed you some videos and we talked about some demo fails. <laughs> Now, a couple words on this. Murphy's Law, anything that can go wrong, oftentimes will. The single biggest mistake you can make during one of these unfortunate moments is exactly what a lot of people do. Fumble around and look like an amateur, which I'm sorry to say, uh, stress is contagious and you can end up really uh, in a bad situation, whether it's a reporter or a prospect that you're demoing the product to. Don't get thrown off your game and click frantically or try to reboot. <laughs> Here are some things that we would recommend to get it back on track. Don't say this has never happened before. <laughs> Almost everybody says that when a demo fails and nobody believes it. Even if you have never encountered that specific bug, you have surely dealt with failures and crashes and outages. Everybody has. So don't act as if it's the first time. Experienced professionals know things go wrong. Murphy's Law. Take a step back. This is an opportunity to turn it into a connection with your audience and demonstrate the strengths of your product or your company. Rather than staying focused on the bug and the problem, make it about something bigger. So there's two steps to that, refocusing on the bigger picture. Number one, be enthusiastic about it. It's hard, I know, but instead of stuttering or mumbling, step it up. This is, let them know this is the most important part of the demo. Use it as an opportunity to show what you do when things go wrong. <laughs> and then refocus on the bigger picture. And that could be things like your product reliability, how much it's growing in terms of customer adoption all over the world, who's using your product, who your customers are, and you know how you're helping them get their jobs done. Those key messages again, they can serve you all the time. Also, disarming people with honesty. I mean, we're all human beings at the end of the day and we know things happen. So let them know you deliver on your promise, but you're also realistic. And once in a while, things do go wrong and you can you know, take the opportunity to walk them through your support experience, spell out the value. Also, be playful. We saw it in the video earlier with Steve Jobs, you know, making the joke about turning off the Wi-Fi. <laughs> if you can have some fun with it, I strongly encourage you to do so because if you can get your prospects or your, you know, reporter friend to, to laugh, that's funny enough. It really helps get rid of tension. And what's much more important than the exact wording or sequence is the state that you're in. Calm and collected and not falling apart. That message you wanna implicitly convey is this isn't a big deal and it can be fixed. Confidence in the solution. Yeah. All right, so Summary points, covered a lot of things today. Number one, keep it simple. We are living in the age of information overload. Distilling it to three points will help you deliver that message in a way that the reporter is going to get it 
and you will see that reflected positively in the coverage that comes out as a result. Prepare for those difficult questions in advance. We sometimes call them rude cues. Anticipate those and be ready. You are always on the record. So again, don't say anything you don't want to see next to your name in print. Stay in control. Don't speculate or guess. And always, always, always be an accessible, reliable source. Because again, it's more than just the one pop shot. You want to develop these lasting positive relationships with these reporters so they come back to you as an expert commentator in the space again and again. And that takes us through. So well, open it up. What questions can we answer for you? Yeah, so while uh, if, if folks have questions and they uh, see we've got a, a couple of, of folks, if you didn't want to ask it on microphone, feel free to type it into the chat window and I'll ask it for you. Otherwise, we can go around and uh, uh, Call, call on folks that have their hands up. Um, one additional story I'll, I'll share is uh, something that um, uh, I've now sat through a number of press briefings, which are kind of a unique situation where you've got people from possibly different organizations and there's kind of a format that they follow that people get up to the podium and my name is spelled such and such, here's my title, here's the organization I'm with. And they'll spell all that to make sure that any of the press uh, that's present has your name spelled correctly and you know, which organization you're with. Um, and so that's kind of drilled into a lot of the reporters that when they first meet you, they say, oh, my name's Christopher, you know, Christopher Smith and da -da. Um, And it gets to be rather interesting when you meet them and they pepper you with questions as you're heading towards the camera and, you know, okay, you know, how do you spell your last name? How do you spell your first name? Okay. And, you know, what's your official title? Da, da. And suddenly the lights come on and they say, I'm here with, you know, Joe Smith uh, from such and such company. And, uh, uh, you know, we're here to talk about X, Y, and Z. And then you want to turn around and thank them. You say, thanks. And you have no idea who the reporter's name. You say, Christopher, Joe, <laughs> Bob. Um, and you realize that when they ask you questions that what's, what's your name and how's that pronounced? That should prompt you to say, oh, while we're at it, how do you, how do you prefer to be called? Um, because the worst thing is once the camera lights are on, you can't rewind and say, do you prefer Steve or Steven? Like that's, that, that's already gone and you're gonna have to go with something like, thank you, anonymous reporter. <laughs> so always get your questions in first and think about what's the first question. And okay, so if I have to thank somebody, do I know their name? Um, because if you're like a lot of technical people, you don't always latch onto names solidly. And three minutes into the, you're, you know, it's only a couple of minutes. It's re really quick on camera at the most. So uh, it's, it's important to have, have that loaded up on a cue card in your head somewhere. Uh, with that, I saw uh, Jim Schibler had his hand up. Uh, you had a question. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, First of all, great, great talk. I really enjoyed your profiling of the different uh, journalists and some of those journeys. So that was, and there were a lot of useful tips in it. So thanks for that. Uh, one tip that I've done is write a press release multiple times at different sizes. So that when I hand it over to an editor, the editing's already done. They pick the one they like and they don't butcher and paste together phrases in ways that make no sense for the technology. So I have a habit of submitting multiple sized press releases, pick the one you like, and I usually get better results that way. Uh, one thing I was wondering is if you had any um, comments you might wanna share on Jen Psaki, the new White House press secretary and some of the stylistic things that she seems to be illustrating some of the stuff you're doing. So I wonder if you had comments around that. Are there any that have stood out for you, Jim, in terms of I mean, she, she's a communications professional. So a lot of what she's doing is, is kind of standard. Uh, but what, 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 is, what has stood out for you, I suppose? Several things. One is I'm gonna tell you all I can and try to be honest. Uh, I will treat you with respect. Yeah. We'll stay here until your questions are answered. I won't be cutting you off. We'll do this again tomorrow. I don't have anything more for you on that. I'll get back to you on that and some of the other deferral techniques that you had yeah. pointed out. So, I mean, I saw some illustrations of the very points that you had. And so I thought that was yeah. 
it's it's worth well, watching. <laughs> I, without being uh, political, I will say it's refreshing because in the context of having a relationship between a, uh, a spokesperson and a member of the press, just like Kara was saying, it's an ongoing relationship. You exactly. don't want to burn a bridge after you know one article or one briefing or one quote. These are folks that you need to maintain your trustworthiness as a source with. They will not come back to you if they uh, felt that you um, deceived them or um, misrepresented something. You want to be, what we tell our clients is, it is your job to be, your goal is to be a resource for members of the press where they are thinking, you know, I need to write a story about, you know, network accelerators and there's only one girl that I know, there's only one product manager I know who, you know, can really boil it down into something accessible and easy to understand for my readership. And so I'm going to reach out to her. Um, we want our clients to be the first call for the editors that their audiences rely on and trust. So trust is the name of the game, being honest. Um, not wasting people's time and being brief are things that I'm seeing the, the press secretary do. And that's a, a great, um, uh, just a, a great model of communication to, to follow. Thank you. The, uh, uh, Chris was asking, um, does your advice change for long form interviews? So if you get invited, for instance, to speak on a podcast mm -hmm. and it's kind of an extended session, uh, yeah. there's obviously kind of different depths of things, but just wondering how that changes versus kind of social media posts or, or other kind of lighter weight things. Uh, does the rule of three still apply when you're doing a podcast it seems like there's a lot more time there well most definitely tom you know whether you're doing a broadcast interview for 30 seconds or whether you're on a half an hour podcast having those three key messages and your news hook that you know the ultimately the the message you want to see at the end of the day and all those supporting points that we talked about the same recipe of success yeah excellent oh well, go on uh, uh, Thelen had a, uh, uh, a question. Did you want to ask on, on camera? All right, I'll assume. Oh, go, go ahead. Okay, yeah, I was just wondering, um, Peggy or Cara, if you guys have any recommendations for new techniques, things to keep in mind when using social media to promote a new product launch. Mm. We could do a whole session on that, <laughs> undo itself. I don't doubt it. <laughs> well, the maybe counterintuitive thing for our, this particular audience, or maybe not, is um, a core element of a successful social media strategy is to spend a lot of your real estate not talking about your product and not talking mm -hmm. about your company. Um, our goal is for every piece of overt promotional content to have at least four uh, pieces of industry coverage or trends that you are observing that is of interest to your audience, to your prospects, to your partners, to your customers. Um, so they see you as the term thought leader gets thrown around a lot, but as a thought leader, someone who is observing the market, someone who's understanding the types of trends that are important to them, that may affect them, that may impact them, have interesting perspectives on them. And then every so often um, share a, a blog that you've written or a piece of overt uh, marketing material like a, a white paper success story. Okay. And do you find most people still kind of focused on using Twitter, LinkedIn uh, for business? Do you see anybody moving more toward using uh, Facebook or Instagram for business? Usually only Facebook or Instagram um, for B2B companies for um, like recruiting. 
So if um, larger multinational enterprises want to show, um, you know, what kind of company they are to work for, some of their corporate responsibility initiatives, um, that's where things like uh, Facebook and Instagram are helpful, you know, what the corporate culture is. But in terms of uh, enterprise business trends, LinkedIn and Twitter are the major channels. Okay. Just wondering if anything changed. Thank you. Great question. One other question I, uh, I've seen come in. Um, Michael Jordan had a great quote at one point in time, and I, 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 I've seen this uh, only a handful of times mentioned, but in, in the current era where it seems like products and companies and everything gets stuck into political alignment of one sort or another, and at the time I remember uh, going back a number of years that uh, somebody was pressuring Michael Jordan to come out and support a particular candidate. And he looked straight into the camera and he said, both political parties buy my shoes and love them. And he just sort of did a mic drop and walked away. And I thought that was the most brilliant thing that I, I mean, a, he's a brilliant athlete, but for somebody to have the presence of mind of I'm not going to alienate a significant percentage of my customers by turning political. So I'm wondering if you have any advice on, uh, other than the Michael Jordan example, any advice on if you're pr if you're pressured to align or or your product is being slanted on one side or the other, how do you thread the needle uh, and 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 keep from getting sucked into politics when you're really just about technology enablement or some other should be neutral category. Mm -hmm. You know, I think businesses should monitor social media platforms, obviously, um, because it's super tricky. This is not going away. I think it's only becoming more and more a part of the reality, especially for B2C and certainly B2B companies too. Um, the, you know, the platforms they used to follow the real impact on these real world events um, they can influence how customers view your organization and the association with that platform. So it's super tricky. I think um, we need to be very aware of all of the alternatives out there beyond just the Facebooks and LinkedIn's and Instagrams of the world as well. Excellent. I see Anna has a question. Would you like to answer or ask directly? Sure. Um, I was just wondering about the visual aspect. You're saying a lot of the impressions are visual, which I totally get for the materials you provide um, when you're you're giving your story and telling your story. But that's also when the actual interview itself, does that apply to like making sure my CEO is on video for a call with the media, even if the media doesn't have their, like, do you know what I'm trying to figure out? What's the yeah, etiquette yeah. for that kind of thing? Mm. Yeah. Right? You, it's not uh, the 80% figure was for those scenarios that are in person. So like presenting at a conference, at a panel, um, on broadcast, being vid uh, uh, recorded in a, a video interview. Um, those are the types of things where you, you know, would want to work with your PR staff on like the lighting, how you're dressed, your, you know, what you do with your hands, if you're really, you know, nervous and kind of flail around. Um, it doesn't mean you, you should be visual in all, in all mediums where there's the opportunity to. Having it, the camera off is fine. If everyone else has their camera off, then it's just like a, you know, an old fashioned uh, telephone. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was kind of wondering, like, is there some? Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Very good. I see uh, Teresa has a question uh, if you'd like to ask directly. Yeah, I was interested in some of the uh, these days what the the big uh, feeder publications and blogs are for, uh, you know, that the the um, publications that are a little higher up the food chain tend to pay attention to and where they get their story ideas. Sure. Well, the the Terrible answer is uh, it depends. 
because when we when we sign on with and this is for b2b you know for b2b of tech, course, of the course. Area, the and the reason i say that is because uh it depends on what um markets your customers are going after so if it's a particular vertical publication or vertical market there are a number of vertical specific publications in like telecommunications or finance for example financial technology that uh some of the larger business national publications will search for to kind of validate are these people real are you know they getting picked up by the tech and trades and then um the technology and trade publications as mentioned the the security publications the networking publications etc um we have this conversation with a lot of our clients very frequently where they are extremely excited about their solution they're wondering when it'll be on the cover of forbes and <laughs> Of course, all of your products are revolutionary and they should be on the cover of Forbes. And, you know, there's a, a crawl, walk, run process where we get that initial validation to your point, Teresa, with the tech and trades that the sales team can use as validation with their specific campaigns. And by promoting the solution by promoting the product by promoting the spokespeople that'll eventually get the attention of the larger national pubs yeah also just to add to that the majority of press have revealed in surveys last year that they get the majority of their news from twitter breaking news interesting mm -hmm. what about just general uh for silicon valley the um you know the the narrow technology focused theater publications who who tech crunch like it used to be tech, tech crunch yeah okay still tech crunch okay what other what others like that uh, if you're a venture funded company venture beat still yeah. okay hmm. it's always interesting to hear kind of what the reporters are we are consuming on their on their media um you know besides their own publication and how much how much of these articles do you think are driven are initiated by a, a pr agency saying oh we've got you know we've got a story and, and we're pushing this out as opposed to like what what do you have a feel for the ratio of like what part is folks reaching out to the reporter versus the reporter saying you know it seems like the zeitgeist of the day is x and i should turn out some articles on that well it's an interesting question tom and it kind of goes back to the parts of our conversation where we talked about the incredible shrinking newsroom <laughs> um you know it would be wonderful if we were still in an era that uh, funded and supported the press in a way that you could have reporters, you know, really thinking about the, the zeitgeist of the day and, you know, reaching out and, and thinking of um, articles and then going after them. And many of them no doubt still do. And uh, many of them are at the, the bigger and well-funded national outlets, but for the, the tech trades, the, certainly the local newsrooms, you know, the, the Mercury News has been mm -hmm. just gutted from, I think, like a tenfold rate since even just 10 years ago. Um, these are folks that really rely on their partners in PR to bring news stories to them. There are still reporters, even at the likes of the Merc, that are on an Amazon beat, for example an Apple beat, where there are still beat reporters that are assigned to individual companies. But um, that is no longer the case at many places. And they rely on PR agencies in many instances to bring news to them, certainly for the types of you know, networking and wireless and telco and some of the more um, inner working technologies that might not be as obvious as a consumer product. Very good. Anybody else? Uh, we've got, we still have a fairly large collection of folks out there. Anybody um, have any additional questions or thoughts or um, experiences to share with uh, you know, observations of what they've seen? I think we've 
we've all probably consumed from working from home, we've all probably in some ways consumed a lot more media than we normally have. And in some cases, maybe not so much. <laughs> All right. Amy, Wait, Jim has his hand up again. Oh, Jim. Yeah, um, you, you've alluded to how much things have changed for journalists over the last you know, decade or two, and we know it has. How has the PR professional business changed, not just in re reacting to that change, but otherwise? Have you seen your business improve or go, stay steady, or have you also taken a hit? How, how has life changed for you over the past couple of decades? Oh, there's a number of ways we could answer that one, Jim. Um, in terms of how the, the practice of PR has changed over the years, it's, it's, it's vast. From the days of uh, mailing out or faxing press releases and mailing photographs, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, to today with the advent of social media and um, all of the, the fun that comes with it, the practice has changed dynamically. Yeah. And okay. because there's more media out there, um, there's more noise. And that's where a good PR agency is more helpful than ever because it helps you cut through that noise and figure out what the narrative is and, and what the signal is. Um, I'm sure you all are experiencing this in your own lines of work. There's more um, expectation about measurement and measurement of metrics and KPIs and closing the loop. Uh, traditionally, it was more challenging to um, calculate the ROI of PR. You know, you would put a press release out there, but being able to tie it back to um, perhaps the sales funnel was a little bit more challenging. There are a number of uh, social listening tools and tracking tools and measurement tools that we use for our clients and that the, our counterparts inside the marketing departments use that track inbound traffic to the site, uh, clicks on gated content. It's a lot more tightly bound with marketing and digital marketing and sales in more of a closed loop than it ever has been before. So a lot of exciting things for being able to, to track and measure all of it. That brings up an interesting thought uh, that just occurred to me on the, you know, when you're hosting your own content, you get all sorts of fantastic Google analytics on how many people clicked it and how yeah. many impressions and all of that. When, when you're placing things in the media is, is one of the, what do you have access to as a PR person to be able to feed back to since, since marketing has turned into a huge amount of analytics? Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure they must have some sets of, of metrics. I'm wondering, you know, in the old days, you'd say, well, there's 10,000 copies of the New York Times out there, you know, that this article appeared in. You, I'm presuming you also are pressed for a huge amount of numbers and analytics to feed back into the marketing analytics engines. Oh, most definitely. Um, in addition to some of those static metrics, we can also use Google Analytics to see the referral traffic and which publications are driving traffic to the websites of our clients, which articles perform the best and which, which messages people resonated with. Yeah. yeah, so even if it's not hosted content on your own site, mm -hmm. You can you can produce numbers yep. for, yep. for folks as, as long as we have that insight to the Google Analytics on the back end, we can see a lot. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. One um, one additional uh, question that occurred to me as as we've dealt with things on a global basis, we're putting kind of content and throwing it up onto the internet. Um, have there been maybe maybe there's less challenges than there were, but any, any thoughts on the international press as far as being picked up by you know, European press who may have a particular slant or mm -hmm. uh, go, going off into the um, South Pacific, you know, Australia, New Zealand and, and Asia PAC, um, any particular interesting things to, to comment about like, trying to produce global PR? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's it's a global interconnected world these days. There is no such thing as just putting a press release out in one country. But what I can say in order to have the, the biggest impact internationally is localization and being able to really tie it into that particular market. Their care about, you know, using statistics for um, their particular regions, your case studies and things that really bring it home to their particular uh, area is oftentimes really effective in placing some of that overarching global content from big corporations in their announcements. Very good. Yeah, I, I, I've seen like grabbing a local customer and not using a U.S. customer to talk to a European. Mm -hmm. It's probably very, very key. Yeah. Local, yeah. local spokesperson, local customers, stat statistics that really help ground it into their particular region. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Well, with that, I think, oh, J uh, Jim, did you have one more? Yeah, just, I just wanted to share a slide really fast. Uh, you were talking about noise out there and yeah. This is the MarTech landscape. This chiefmartech.com does a study oh, no. every year. And this oh, is no. the number of marketing technology solutions in April, 2020. And they put it into this island. It used to be something you could actually follow. If you look at the chart here, look at how much this stuff has grown. This is just people selling software for people to put marketing stuff out there. Whew. That just kind of gives a view into how noisy it's getting out there. Oh, yeah. I have that in my book, although I have the 20, I'm looking at now the 2019 version, which yeah. is around 7,000. And it started, it was only 150 in 2011. Oh, my goodness. It's scary Teresa. to see what's going to come out this year, huh? Uh, we're, we're rapidly approaching microfiche. Uh, <laughs> My reading glasses will not take that whatsoever. <laughs> anyway, it's an interesting thing to look at. Yeah. Martech, Chiefmartech.com, you can look it up. Th uh, thanks for sharing that, Jim. That was, yeah, sure. that was interesting to see. It's world is getting more complicated in some ways. Well, that's why you got to be so on message. That's yeah, right. <laughs> cut through the noise. <laughs> Well, with that, I think uh, I think we've come to the end of our, our set of questions here. I would really like to thank Kara and, and Peggy for sharing their time and their wisdom with us. So Jim's clapping. I think a lot of other people are clapping, but probably not on camera. Um, this has been immensely uh, interesting. I'd remind folks that uh, we typically have the recordings uh, available within a couple of weeks uh, on the website. Uh, so keep an eye on that or, or our YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, as always, uh, stay tuned with that. We have uh, uh, a range of interesting topics. If you had a chance to, um, if you had some colleagues that weren't able to make it, you say, oh, now that I've, I've heard this presentation, uh, I really wish some other folks in my company uh, had, had not missed this evening. Uh, feel free to point them in our direction. Uh, and uh, you'll be able to, to point them to the YouTube channel and uh, uh, spread the knowledge and the wealth. Um, and uh, I, I think that's, that's all about uh, helping each other and, and growing our skill sets and, and knowledge that we can all, uh, all share with one another. So uh, with that, again, I'd like to, to thank uh, our speakers and uh, please keep an eye on the website. We don't have our next meeting uh, details out yet, but we are very close to publishing them. So within the next week or so, uh, we should have next, uh, we're already going for the March meeting um, and we'll have the details out for that. So uh, stay tuned and thank you all for coming and for your wonderful questions and look forward to seeing you next, next month.